Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's, it's time, time for, for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom. Where we have Biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 All right. Welcome back to Boom. I'm Hannah. And I'm Melissa. I'm glad we do that, just in case we forget. Yeah. <laughs> Today, we had a really fun interview. We had Professor John McPhee on the show, and we learned a lot about opportunities for biomechanics in sports performance, as well as the future and challenges of predictive simulations, which was really fun to talk about since I didn't really know much about what was going on in that area. We also talked about how we can integrate learnings from the automotive industry to advance the field of biomechatronics. And John also shared some of his philosophy on leadership, which is something Melissa and I really related to and I think something we can all learn from. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to share the conversation that we have with John. But before we do that, we have a bit of boom. 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 So today's Bit of Boom follows this theme of sports performance that we talk about in the interview. John even mentions volleyball in some of his research. And today's Bit of Boom is about a recent study that was published in the Journal of Biomechanics in May 2021 on the biomechanics of hang time in volleyball spike jumps by Gupta, Jensen, and Abraham at the University of Texas at Austin. And these researchers looked at if skilled volleyball players experience hang time during spike jumps and what the underlying mechanisms of that are. So whether there's actually this period of greatly reduced or even zero vertical velocity of the head and trunk during their jump. So they had 15 volleyball players that participated and performed spike jumps in two different conditions. So they did it either with or without their knees flexed. And I really like the experimental setup for this research study because they really tried to simulate game conditions. So they hung up a volleyball net in the laboratory at standard height. They made markings for the attack and center lines on the lab floor. And then the athletes hit a foam volleyball that was mounted on a rotating horizontal metal arm that was attached to one of the net poles. So they found that with knee flexion, the head and trunk demonstrated hang, but without, uh, not without knee flexion. They also found that women demonstrated longer hang during flight than men and that the athletes hit the ball later in flight in the hang condition. So the study led to a better understanding of the mechanics associated with hang, which can be useful since additional time in the air can be beneficial for an athlete when they can use it to adjust the ball trajectory, deciding where, when, and how to hit the ball. I love playing sand volleyball, but since it's co-ed, like I can barely reach the top of the net when I'm <laughs> jumping. So <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know if bending my knees to increase hang is going to be super helpful when my hang is already below uh, the top of the net, but I could see this as a useful finding and information to help inform elite athletes and volleyball players. <laughs> I feel like if you bend your knees, you look extra cool. Like it looks like you're like floating in the air. So you could just do it just for that reason. Yeah, it might be worth <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Like I feel like the Instagram shot is optimal if you bend your knees. So that could be another thing you're optimizing for. Yeah, we talk about optimizations, uh, strategies, and cost functions. So that might be an important one in our volleyball jumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that bit of boom, Melissa. You always find something interesting and relevant. And I think that I'll think about that next time I get to play volleyball. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Boom. We are here with John McPhee, professor and Canada Research Chair at the University of Waterloo. And his research focuses on modeling, simulation, model-based control, and optimal design of dynamic physical systems. So lots of things that we really get excited about on Boom. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Well, thanks for having me. Before we get started, we're really curious, when was the first time you knew you wanted to be a biomechanist? Well, that goes back a long time. I'm almost afraid to say how long it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime around 1984. So I was an undergrad student in mechanical engineering. I took a course, a technical elective in biomedical engineering, and, you know, it was mostly electrical signal processing, but it had a little bit of biomechanics in it, which I thought was pretty cool. 
And then I spent a summer term working with an orthopedic surgeon, and then I was I was hooked. I did my master's and PhD in the general area of system dynamics, but I think that actually paid off for me because it allowed me to sort of tackle different application areas, in, including, of course, biomechanics. And then once I became a faculty member, I could choose my own research directions, and the second grad student I ever had worked on the dynamics of the human hand. So I would say for decades, I've been interested in biomechanics, and uh, it's just such a fascinating topic. It really is. And what about that experience with the orthopedic surgeon got you hooked on biomechanics? Well, he, he took me into the surgery and, and, you know, I saw him do things that I, I didn't think people could do. You know, he replaced cruciate ligaments. He did, uh, he did some stuff to an ankle joint that was just amazing. I mean, this person who couldn't walk was walking again after the surgery. It was kind of a blend of really cutting edge technology and then like old school carpentry. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, you know, he had a tool chest with hammers and chisels and all kinds of stuff, but then wow. some high end technologies that really, really got me uh, motivated. Yeah, I bet. There's such a difference between, I think, knowing that you can do these types of surgeries or hearing that somebody had a surgery and then actually seeing a surgeon do that and just recognizing how incredible the human body is and the ability to recover from something like that. And uh, it's just also, yeah, just really fascinating. So you direct the motion research lab and your research is focused on dynamic simulation and motion-based control, design optimization of mechanical, mechatronic, and biomechatronic multi-body systems. Could you give us a brief brief overview of some of the current projects within these topics uh, that your team is working on? So uh, the way I used to explain it to my mother was, um, we're very interested in things that move, (laughs) especially humans, you know, who are using tools or machines. And we call that combination biomechatronics. So, So a human utilizing a tool or a machine, we call that a biomechatronic system. There's kind of three key areas we're working on in the lab. The one is uh, so-called predictive simulations or what-if simulations. So what if we did this to the human? How would they move afterwards? Um, So, for example, we've got some projects going on on human walking and balance control, either wearing an exoskeleton or without an exoskeleton. We have a project with a company on optimal positioning of hip implants and knee implants, so that we're trying to tell the surgeon where they should be placing these implants for the best possible outcome for their patients. We're working on uh, wheelchair propulsion and basketball shooting with our with our national wheelchair basketball team. We're doing some predictive dynamic simulations of cycling and volleyball jumping and golf swings, which is something I'm particularly interested in. So that's in terms of simulated work, so predictive simulations. Secondly, we are doing quite a bit of work on real-time control, specifically model predictive control. So based on the models we do in the first part, we then use them to develop real-time controllers. And for example, we have a stroke rehab robot in our lab that we tune for different patients. Um, We have both upper and lower limb exoskeletons Obviously, you have to control those in real time because somebody's wearing them and they expect real time feedback Mm. and control. And, you know, the third area where we've done a lot of work is on real time model based control of electric cars and autonomous cars. And you think, well, what the heck does that have to do with biomechanics? Well, there's actually a fair bit of overlap in the underlying technologies. And so some of the stuff we've done for autonomous cars, we've been able to leverage on the biomechanical side. And then I'd say the third main class of projects we're working on involves machine learning. And so typical examples would be uh, we're developing machine learning models to map EMG signals to torques and vice versa. So we're replacing the inverse dynamic problem with a neural network. Hmm. We're using machine learning to uh, tune those controllers on our rehab robot and our exoskeleton controllers. Because one thing people don't tell you about controllers is they all need tuning. And so we're using machine learning to do that. Everybody who works in biomechanics knows all about motion capture and gluing little spheres on (laughs) body parts (laughs) at bony landmarks and so on. We've been doing quite a bit of work on getting rid of the markers. 
um, and using computer vision and machine learning to do 3D pose estimation. And uh, that, that area is just exploding right now. And the idea is that eventually we'll pull out our, our iPhone and we'll take a video of somebody doing a movement and we will be able to extract from that automatically all of the 3D joint angles. And then eventually driving towards it, why not do a full inverse dynamic analysis on your phone? It's certainly powerful enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the last thing we're doing is, is something that kind of came over from our autonomous car stuff. We're doing uh, environment recognition using a wearable mm -hmm. camera. So if somebody's walking with an exoskeleton, uh, if they have a wearable camera, we, we put it on our chest. It can recognize the environment like, uh oh, you're coming up the stairs. You better switch mode on your exoskeleton because you're no longer on level ground. And so we're doing some environment recognition work using machine learning. So that's that's a little snapshot of the three areas. So predictive simulations, model based control and some machine learning stuff going on. Wow. It's really cool that you've described. Well, one, thank you for starting off with you know, understandable definition and keeping that clear and clarified for all of us. It's really helpful. And we really appreciate when people describe things as they w might to their mom or something, but then can also talk <laughs> at a technical level that's interesting to us. So, and it's it's quite amazing to see such a breadth of areas that you are working on. And I liked with your last point saying something you borrowed from, you know, what you were working on with cars was actually applicable to what you were doing more in biomechanics. And so we're wondering if there were other lessons that were sort of interchangeable between the disparate areas and yeah what is the utility of getting to work on so many different things rather than you know some other labs have a very clear and kind of niche focus <laughs> to answer your question i think we learn a lot if we look at other application domains you know why reinvent the wheel if somebody's already pro solved this problem for us but they just haven't looked at biomechanics as a potential application of that technology in terms of all these different areas, you know, they, they look different, but under the hood, in every one of our applications, we're developing system models and we're doing some sort of optimization or optimal control. And so in terms of the system models, um, we use a technology called graph theory. And the reason why we use graph theory is it because it allows us to mix components from multiple domains. So, you know, we might have mechanical components and electrical components if we're doing a car, but we, we might also need to have human joints and muscle models in our system model and maybe even some chemical models like for metabolism or a battery. And so graph theory allows us to very systematically combine components from all these domains into a single system model. And so, you know, in, instead of having like one model for the human and then a separate model for the robot, we actually have a single model that we could then use to develop our controllers or our optimal controllers or what have you. Another thing we use a lot for all of our applications is something called symbolic computing. You know, this and this is we use the Maple uh, programming language to, to facilitate symbolic computing. So basically, all of our dynamic equations, you can you can see them. Not that you would ever want to, because they're really long and really complicated. But because of that, you can share them with other people easily. And most importantly, you can generate really fast simulation code. And, you know, if you've ever done some of these predictive biomechanical simulations that take hours and hours to do, fast simulation code is important. The other thing about symbolic computing is it'll give you an exact derivative. So uh, if you're doing optimization, uh, or optimal control or model predictive control, it's really nice to have derivative information because things converge much more quickly than they do otherwise. So that's core behind a lot of our applications. And in fact, our, our modeling algorithms that are based on graph theory and symbolic computing, they, they were commercialized almost 15 years ago in a package called MapleSim. It's used all around the world and, and we use it for a lot of our applications, not exclusively, but when we get into multi-domain system modeling, we'll typically turn to the software because it's got stuff underneath the hood that, that works for multi-domain and it's quick. Maple Sim sounds very Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> can't argue with that. You know, yeah. we just finished maple syrup season here, so I can't argue with that. <laughs> Just to dig a little bit deeper and to give our audience a better understanding, could you just give us like a one sentence explanation of what graph theory is, since that seems so core to what you're doing? 
Sure. So graph theory is a mathematical tool. It, it's developed in, in faculties of mathematics around the world. So you might have a department of combinatorics, for example, where they develop graph theoretic algorithms. Um, it's used to solve any problem involving topology or connectivity. So, you know, you might have heard of the traveling salesman problem where you have to go between these different cities in the most efficient way possible. Or you might need to print a computer chip and figure out how to put all the wires on a layer without the wires crossing. You know, these are all examples of problems involving connectivity that have been solved using graph theory. So in our case, we use graph theory to automatically generate system models. So we grab a whole bunch of components, you know, like a, like an upper arm and a forearm, and we connect them with an elbow joint. And then we put some muscles in there. And then maybe we put an exoskeleton on top of all of that, including electrical motors. All of the components are represented by their own constitutive laws. And then graph theory takes care of generating the system level equations. Mm. And uh, there's very well-known algorithms for taking all of the component level models and how they're connected and turning it into a system level model. And, and that's how we use it. Yeah, thank you. That's so helpful. I think it, it's so fascinating to hear you modeling the body, body in such mechanistic ways and thinking about the relationships between, or I guess overlap between the body and other mechanical things like like vehicles and yeah, it's, it's really cool to see that come together in your research. And we're hoping to hone in a little bit on one of the first topics you said that you talked about, which was predictive simulation. And we've heard that there's a bit of friendly competition within the biomechanics community to develop the first fully predictive gate simulation. And we're wondering what makes you most excited about this goal and what you think the biggest challenges are to accomplishing it. Well, if it's a competition, nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> friendly, Keith. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> <as> friendly. <laughs> Honestly, I don't feel like it is a competition because um, this community, this biomechanics community, especially especially researchers working in predictive simulations, they're very sharing and open with their ideas and even their algorithms. So, for example. BJ Fregley has been a huge help to us recently, giving us some really nice suggestions on our optimal control solutions. We've reciprocated by sharing some of our foot ground contact models and our friction models. Everybody I talk to in this community seems very supportive of advancing the state of the art in a very unselfish way. So um, it's one thing I really love about this community. Our first predictive simulation of GATE was published in 2007. And I said to my master's student at the time, I said, okay, go off and create a simulation of GATE so that we can then get to work on some prosthetic ankle designs. And I said, how hard can that be? <laughs> and then a year later, <laughs> we had like the first crude walking simulations. And then I realized, oh, this is a really, really hard problem. Much, much harder than like an autonomous car control, for example. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for it. First of all, you know, if you're, if you're trying to do predictive simulation, then you're trying to determine what the muscles are doing. And so it becomes an optimal control problem because you're trying to solve for time-varying muscle inputs. So you're not solving for one or two things. You're solving for a whole lot of things that are changing in time. And to solve that problem, you need a cost function. You need to minimize something. Well, you know, what are people minimizing when they walk? We are still arguing about that. That's still an open research question. If you're doing inverse dynamics, then you're probably measuring foot ground contact forces on force plates and then feeding them into your simulation. If you're doing predictive simulations, that means you're not relying on experiments. So you have to model that foot ground contact, including all of the forces and moments and center of pressure. It's very hard to model it accurately. And the results you get are very sensitive to that contact model. And then lastly, if you've ever watched a child learning to walk, you know, there's an element of balance control here, right? So your simulations, I mean, the, after our first year, we had a model that fell down more often than it didn't. <laughs> so we basically had like 
like a six month old walker <laughs> who would fall down more often than they successfully walk. So, so the balance control is the third challenge that you have to overcome if you're doing a fully predictive simulation. If you do an inverse dynamics, then you measure all of this stuff and it's easy. You, you, know, you just match the experimental data. But predicting the future with no experimental data to go from, it's a real, it's a very hard problem. Yeah, and I think at the beginning of that, you noted the difference between autonomous cars and hu- like you know this sort of more human-based thing. And I think what you made me realize is that the difference is that we we invented cars, but we did not invent humans, right? <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit of more mechanistic knowledge that we have insight into with the car problem, which, yeah, just kind of, it's a humbling the science that we do, I think, in those aspects, right? You know, I, I used to do a lot of car stuff. I was a Toyota research chair. We did tons of work on electric vehicles, autonomous cars. And um, But the more work I did on the biomechanics side, I realized humans are way harder to work on. You know, if we have a problem with one of our cars, we take it apart. We measure stuff. We can measure anything. I have no idea what the joint reactions in my elbow joint are as I wave my hands around here. I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm optimizing when I get up out of my chair when I sit down in my chair. In a car, well, we program it. It's just such an easier application that um, I find I find the biomechanics work, which is where I spend all my time nowadays, just so much more challenging. And when you can solve a small piece of that puzzle, it's very satisfying. Yeah. As you're saying that, it reminds me of when we would do predictive finite element analysis simulations at when I was at Toyota. And right, it is like you plug in the material properties, you know, the shape of it, you know how it's going to be moving and then you solve it and you can change some things around and run it again. And, you know, then you we would do crash simulation. So then we would crash the car and it would be pretty close to what we would predicted and what we expected. But with people, you can ask them to do something and yeah, the way it happens is unlike anything you could have predicted. And there's so many other components going into it that we don't have really the, you know, even when it comes to sort of the mechanical properties of it and the tissue properties and things that we still have limited understanding of, it makes it for a very challenging problem. And what is your brain doing? You know, right. what is your brain telling your human motor control system to do? It's, it's, who knows? <laughs> I mean, there's lots of people. Fortunately, there's a lot of smart people working on this problem. So, you know, we try to stay up on the literature in human motor control because that's an area that's advancing quickly as we learn more about how humans control the way they move. It's, it's really exciting stuff. Some of your research actually focuses on things that we interact with, like especially in sports. So things that you actually can measure mechanical properties of, like we're talking about. And you've investigated effects of different properties of sports equipment or how it's used, like a golf shaft's get balance point and what are... Uh, We're wondering, this is kind of a hard question, what are the steps to translating that knowledge, what you're learning about something that's tangible or feasible, and how do you translate that to an athlete? Really, how are you bridging that modeling to what can happen in reality? Well, a, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, we do lots of experiments, of course, and prototyping. So we have some concepts in the computer. We make sure that we we build it or test it to make sure it matches reality as best we can, you know, given everything we just said about the difficulties of modeling humans. Um, we're lucky we have very well-equipped labs. So we, you know, what we can measure, you know, we can measure quite well and quite accurately. But what my, my former university president used to say was, um, the best tech transfer is a pair of shoes. <laughs> and so, the, and the idea was that, we should just walk to where we're going to transfer our technology. And in our case, we work directly with companies and coaches. So, you know, we work, we work with a lot of companies like Toyota, like uh, IntelliJoint Surgical, Ping Golf, Orthopedic Surgeons. I'm not sure if I can call them a company or not, but I'm going to call them a company. <laughs> Orthopedic Surgeons, Cleveland Golf, our wheelchair curling and basketball court coaches. So we, we basically work directly with the end users and we make sure we give them what they, what they need, whatever it is they're looking for. And sometimes it's just advice on technique, you know, try this, try that. Um, other times it's a specific training device. It, it really depends on 
what our partner is looking for. We try to keep them happy. How have you found translating what they're asking for like into something tangible and then translating it back to them? Like, what is that process like? Oh, um, it, it involves a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion, <laughs> especially especially since, you know, every every domain seems to have its own vernacular. You know, uh, you know, we, you know, we talk to engineers at Toyota and they'll and they'll use particular words to describe modeling and simulation and control and objectives. And then we'll talk to an orthopedic surgeon. And that is a completely different language, which we have to learn. And so we spend a lot of time just trying to communicate expectations with our partners so that we understand what they want and they understand what we can deliver. And so we we spend it's work, but it's important work so that each side has reasonable expectations of the other side. And I think once we accomplish that, then everybody's happy, assuming we can meet the expectations we lay out at the beginning of the project. Um, but but honestly, language, especially in biomechanics, language can be a big barrier to some collaborations. You know, try 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 talking to an orthopedic surgeon about some three D rotation transformations, which we're doing right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and the language we would use is completely different from the way they would describe the same rotation transformations. And so we almost need a translator in the room. Need with your us. right hand. <laughs> yeah. So what happens? What happens is uh, we become the translators. Okay, <laughs> so he means this, which means that. So we should say this, and then we go ahead. Well, it's important point that you make, and good that it, it seems like you're learning how to adapt to that versus just trying to continue on with you know, the way, the language that we know, taking a step back and being like, how can we make this communication more effective and taking what you learn from them and then being willing to change and alter the language that you're using to better suit the situation? Well, you know, people like us in, in higher education, I think we're all kind of naturally curious by nature. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, this is just another learning opportunity. And so <laughs> if you look at it that way, then, you know, it can be kind of, fun, at least challenging. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. We saw in your bio that you're golf advisor for Golf Digest. And um, you've been talking about sort of the partners that you've had in industry or collaborations. And I'm wondering what is sort of this advice, is this advising role different than sort of having just a partner collaboration in industry? And what, yeah, just more about what that kind of role was like. So with Golf Digest, yeah, I've been one of their tech advisors since uh, 2006, so about 15 years now. And my role there is to advise the equipment editors who evaluate new technologies in the sport of golf. Um, and so that's that's kind of an ongoing thing. You know, we'll exchange emails all year round, and they'll have new questions uh, about some new technology or biomechanics, which is really can be very interesting. Um, We also meet every year at something called the Hot List, the Hot List Summit. And that's where we evaluate all the new clubs coming out that year. Um, So typically we would meet in person in October. We obviously didn't this past year. And we would meet at some location with a meeting room. And the manufacturers would ship us their new products, usually about $3,000 worth of golf clubs, we would, you know, we, we spend a lot of time looking at their technical claims and what are the new technologies coming out of the companies and, you know, basically evaluating whether it looks promising or not. Um, it's really, it's really enjoyable because we get like the first inside look at new technologies coming out into that sport. And you have to realize that there's more patents in golf than all other sports combined. Hmm. So a lot of the innovations in golf eventually make their way into other sports. You know, in Canada, hockey, for example. So, you know, there were graphite, there were graphite shafts in in golf clubs. And then five years later, all of a sudden we have graphite shafts and hockey sticks. So you sort of see this trickle down effect from golf into other sports. Um, The other nice thing is I I work on a panel with four or five other experts. And so, you know, it's not just me talking to equipment editors. It's a bunch of us talking about these new technologies. and, and, And that's really that's really fun and educational. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll say that there's huge opportunities for here, here for, for experience in biomechanics because 
you know, from, from the 90s to the 10s, there were big increases in driving distances due to equipment. But the last 10 years, a lot of the gains have come from physical conditioning and strength. And I mean, mm. you just look at Bryson DeChambeau this year, but not just Bryson DeChambeau. If you look at, if you look at the, the modern golf athlete versus somebody from 20 years ago, you'll see a huge difference in physical conditioning. And, and we're seeing huge gains in performance as a result of that. And so the golfing community is becoming more and more interested in biomechanics all the time, hmm. as are other sports, as they should. I'm wondering whether, as you're saying, like it's really important to consider the human and how their physique interacts with the equipment that they're using, particularly in golf, where you're seeing better performance with increased physical you know, improvements to the human. So I'm just wondering what that looks like with regards to designing the equipment. If there are different considerations, knowing that there are like, you know, increased physical capabilities on the human side, if that changes how you might design the equipment that they're interacting with. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, it isn't just at, at the top edge. It, it's really across the whole spectrum of golfers. Everybody swings a golf club differently. You know, we could talk about all kinds of different human movements, but since we're picking on golf, it is an action that requires a very high level of coordination. It requires a lot of muscles firing in the right order, usually from proximal to distal. And uh, the timing has to be just right because you're trying to hit this very small contact area with a moving club head that's moving at, say, 100 miles an hour. And it has to be pointing in the right direction. So there's a lot of things that have to come together to make that a success. And so if you can tailor your equipment for an individual golfer, then they're going to have much greater success. And there are really there are a lot of ways to do that. Right now, golf clubs have a lot of adjustability into them. They'll have moving weights, for example, in the club head so that you can change where the center of mass is located. You can change the moment of inertia a little bit. The hosel where the shaft connects to the club head will be adjustable. So you can change, for example, the loft and the lie of the golf club. Even the shaft itself, it's a, it has to be flexible. That's, that contributes to your performance by having a flexible shaft. And you can tailor the flexibility to different golfers. So somebody with a slow, you know, perhaps a less smooth swing might require one shaft design. You know, somebody like, uh, you know, Tiger Woods uh, would require a very different shaft design. But the point is that you can tune the shaft to the different golfers. And the best way to do it is to use a predictive simulation. Because (laughs) I'm dead serious, because it allows you to try out different clubs on a computer in silico, you can try out thousands and thousands of different combinations of designs before you come up with a few promising designs that you then prototype and hand to the golfer. And honestly, it saves you so much time and money. It, it, it is crazy. There's just so much time and money saved that uh, all of the companies are moving towards predictive simulations of the golf swing. Wow. And so it's really, it must be really incredible to work with such high performing athletes. And I think it's interesting how what you learn from them can then translate to more of you know, recreational athletes and people who aren't quite at that level, but could still benefit from some of these advances. And it kind of reminds me of some of the other projects that you've talked about um, with other athletes that you've worked with. So you've had a number of projects alongside Team Canada Olympic and Paralympic athletes to enhance their sports performance and equipment design. And so I'm wondering what has been the most fun part of working with these elite athletes? Well, you know, it, it's just fun working with elite athletes when you see them, when you see them in action. You know, I, I, I went and saw some of, uh, you know, the Canadian Olympic track cyclists train. And honestly, you know, these, these people are, are basically legs and lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Their thighs were bigger than my waist. They are just so powerful and so at the top of their game. It's just, you know, it's just awe-inspiring to watch them at the top of their sport. And it's great to help them compete against others who are the best in the world, especially Paralympians. 
because Paralympic athletes just don't get the same level of attention or the same level of funding that an Olympic athlete gets. And every single Paralympic athlete and coach we have worked with has been super grateful and incredibly engaged with us. Uh, just so happy to be collaborating uh, on a particular project that is of direct benefit to them. So I, I, that's my shout out for Paralympic athletes and coaches. Now, in terms of challenges, uh, it's actually easier to work with elite athletes than the average person doing an activity of daily living. And there's two reasons for that. I have no idea what cost function you are minimizing when you do your walking to the kitchen and pouring a cup of coffee. But when we deal with an Olympic athlete, the cost function is basically the Olympic model. It's faster, higher, stronger. That is literally the cost function we're using for these people. When we worked with the Olympic cycling team, our cost function was basically go as far as you can in, three, in four seconds. And that was the cost function. And from that one cost function, we were able to reproduce optimal human movements for Olympic track cyclists coming out of a standing gate. So it's actually less challenging than you think compared to activities of daily living. Um, the other great thing about elite athletes is their motions are highly repeatable. You know, like we worked with Paralympic curlers throwing, throwing curling stones and the standard deviations they have is so small. <laughs> they can show, throw the same, same shot over and over again. Or if you look at professional golfer, if you look at where they hit the ball on the club face, you can basically put a dime over that contact sport, uh, over that contact point. And if you look at where you and I hit a golf ball on the club face, well, it's basically <laughs> anywhere on the club face. Anywhere on the club face. You know, you, you know, you, you can't even cover it with a dollar bill. <laughs> so uh, it's actually easier to work with these elite athletes um, for those two reasons. That's super interesting because I think the populations Melissa and I work with tend to be, you know, have they tend to be older or have other underlying diseases and things like that. And that makes like the individual variability so high and it makes it hard to figure out treatments and what's right for people and everyone's in, an individual. So that is a I much harder frame. problem to solve. <laughs> <laughs> you have a much harder problem to solve than I have. <laughs> but it's interesting, you noted earlier that there's still profiles within that people have individualistic ways of moving, even despite them being quite repeatable or precise. That's very true. Yeah, even at the top levels of the game, everybody has their own distinct style, some more than others. Yeah. I'm also curious when you talk about the how amazing these collaborations have been with Olympic athletes and and particularly Paralympic athletes. How do those sort of collaborations sort of come about, um, and how do you yeah just foster those connections? Well, they come about in many different ways. Sometimes people reach out to us because they see us doing something similar to what they need done. Um, so, for example, they might see us publish some work in autonomous cars, and then another company, mm -hmm. we need some like an autonomous robot, then they might approach us. Sometimes it's through uh, connections that we have. You know, somebody says, oh, yeah, you know, I, I can't solve that problem, but, you know, maybe McPhee's group at the University of Waterloo can solve that problem. Um, honestly, there, there are many different ways that we end up collaborating with companies. Sometimes we work with our own students who have gone off and, and started companies like IntelliJoint Surgical was a startup company. And, you know, those guys went off, started a very successful company, and then they came back for help when they needed some help with a particular topic. Mm. Honestly, I could probably come up with 10 different ways we end up working with a particular partner. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really, I think it's exciting to think about those kind of collaborations, but it's also helpful to, I think sometimes when you think about them, it seems out of reach or, it's nice to have some tangible ways and ideas that we might be able to start some of those projects. Sometimes you can reach out yourself to these potential partners. So, you know, sometimes we'll come up with an application. We've got a new one right now with, with, with darts. <laughs> We've got a new application with darts. And so, uh, again, it involves machine learning and computer vision, whereby you hold your phone up to a dartboard and it automatically calculates your score for you. 
I don't well, know if you're like me, but you know, I get tired of subtracting numbers from 501 when I play darts. <laughs> so we developed we developed an application using machine learning that does that. And so now we'll reach out to some dart manufacturers and some dartboard companies and some people, even professional darts association, those ones will reach out to ourselves. And you know, if you've got if you've got a message that piques their interest, then they'll respond. Um, and if you don't, then they won't respond, and that's okay. <laughs> now, what is your machine algorithm? What kind of score do you get for the darts that you throw that stick into the wall next to the board? Is that is there some <laughs> kind of loophole for that that could work in my favor? <laughs> I should tilt my camera so you can see my dartboard, and you can see all the holes in the wall right below my dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I need a bigger. I think dartboards should be bigger, personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree. Something else that we wanted to talk about when we talk to your students, they really emphasize how you're just a really genuine, approachable, uh, welcoming. Uh, they even described you as a father figure in their life, which we thought was just so so wonderful. And we can tell even by our conversation, you've been just really easy to talk to you and we've learned so much and they also emphasized your your leadership skills quite heavily and so we're curious in terms of your leadership philosophy what advice would you give for like, the next generation of leaders are there specific like tips or what have you learned from your experience as a leader well, first of all, I hadn't heard that from my students, so um, <laughs> I'm going to have to be extra nice to them now in our next meeting tomorrow. <laughs> Honestly, it's really nice to hear that, that kind of feedback. Uh, what would be my three most important pieces of advice? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, it, it's all about people. In fact, I have a poster in my office that, that I made myself and I put over my door and it says, it's all about people. Um, so I think it's really important to maintain good relationships between everybody in your group. It takes work and time and energy and open lines of communication, especially during pandemic times. Um, but I think it's it's one of the most important things I do is just to maintain a good dialogue between myself, my students, and and the members of our research team, because we are a team and we like solving problems together. The second thing builds on that idea. Um, I really like everybody in my group to learn from each other. Um, and that means that uh, everybody gets a chance to be heard. Um, I think it's really important to share ideas with each other because we all benefit. There's not one member of the group who is going to have all of the answers. So for that reason, I think it's important that, that we learn from each other. And then finally, you have to make work fun. You have to have some fun at work. Um, we spend a lot of time there. Um, we put in lots of hours and, and effort. So it's got to be fun. So, you know, we pick fun projects that are still still novel and cutting edge, but we enjoy doing. Uh, and we have lots of social activities. We have barbecues together. We curl. You know, we're in Canada, so we curl. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like <laughs> Sometimes we go hit golf balls. We go bowling, you know, whatever. <laughs> but we spend time together outside of work to continue. Those are all super, I think, important to Melissa and I, and it's nice to hear them uh, validated in your lab and culture that you've set out and like been very intentional about too. So we really appreciate that um, and you sharing that. And clearly your students think so too. <laughs> well, I, I'm, you have no idea how happy I am to hear that. Maybe sort of on the other end of, you know, of leadership, there's often times where you feel like maybe you're not performing as well as you could, or you failed, or, you know, you're not succeeding at least. So we're wondering if there's a time in your career where you felt this way, and if you could share what that experience was like, and what you learned from it. Um, well, what immediately comes to mind is, are some grant proposals I've written. You know, mm -hmm. as a faculty member, you write a lot of grant proposals, and sometimes they're very large, and they take a lot of effort and a lot of work. I've been fortunate to get quite a few of them funded, but not all of them. And so I've had some very large grant proposals not funded after putting so much work into it. And so, you know, that feels like a failure. Um, you know, they didn't like your proposal or whatever. For whatever reason, you know, this thing that you put so much time and energy into didn't get funded. I guess what did I learn from that experience? I guess what I learned was, you know, at the end of the day, not everything is under your control. 
you know, sometimes you just have to do the best job you can, you know, doing your due diligence and let it go. Let it go out to reviewers and so on. Be content with the knowledge that you did your best and then forget about it and go home and have a meal with your family and your friends and uh, and move on. I think as long as you do put your best effort forward, there's going to be failures and you just got to move on. from it. Yeah. That's like such an important lesson. I think it's the time between where you get the feedback and then can move on is always like <laughs> the tough part, right? It's like yeah. eventually, hopefully you're able to move on, but then how fast you can do that or, you know, what resources you use to do that are often like quite variable, I think. Yeah. I mean, it even happens at the paper level, you know, like, like we've had some, we've had some dynamite papers get rejected and we think, wow, this was such a good paper. Why did they reject that? And then you know, uh, we'll see some other papers that I didn't think were as good and they'll just fly through the review process. And that's when you realize, okay, you know, this isn't entirely under my control. Some of these things are just outside my hands. You know, we just keep trying to write high quality papers or grant proposals, whatever. And you're not always going to be successful. Just do your best. Sounds like a good way to sleep at night too. (laughs) Um. Yeah, yeah. I probably speak Speak the speaking, what's the word? How do I say it? I probably talk the talk better than I walk the walk. (laughs) (laughs) It's easy to say. It's not as easy to do in practice. (laughs) Well, we appreciate you sharing. And and this has just been such a wonderful time. And we're getting towards our last question. So we're just wondering, before we ask that, how can people learn more about you and your work and kind of keep track of all these different things you're doing and keep updated? Well, I probably have the same answer as everybody else on your show. Uh, You know, we have a website. We have a group website. It's the Motion Research Group or just morg, M-O-R-G, dot uwaterloo.ca. We try to keep it up to date, but like every website, it's usually a little bit behind. That's where most of my team members are located in their projects, and that's where you can learn most about us. Or just contact me if you have any questions. Fire me an email and uh, we can have a chat. Yeah, thank you. I I always wonder. I've, I've people on here have, have offered that up before, and I always wonder if students, you know, actually do take people up on that opportunity. But I definitely encourage it, and um, it's so kind of you to offer it that those conversations with students who are curious. So thank you for that. And our last question for you is: What are you most excited about for the future of biomechanics? Well, one thing that excites me is the fact that the FDA, the US FDA. Uh, has recently endorsed the use of computer simulations in the design and the regulatory approval of new biomedical devices. Wow. And as a result of that, um, that greatly accelerates the development cycle because, you know, these simulations are now replacing time-consuming and expensive clinical trials. And so, uh, you know, predictive dynamic simulations that we've been discussing of biomechanical or, or biomechatronic systems, they're going to play a huge role in this, either through a collaboration with existing companies or maybe by starting your own company uh, in the medical device area. And this is actually going to open up that whole field to more competition because there's no longer going to be this huge cost barrier to entry. And so we're going to see more and more assistive devices that are getting through the FDA because they're not, they don't need the deep, deep pockets that you used to need to do all of this clinical trial work, because you can do a lot of the, the first steps using predictive simulation. So I think that's really exciting for the field. Just as a side note, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about model predictive control. Model predictive control has seen almost no application to biomechanics or biomechatronics. And, you know, it's, it's been shown that it's a pretty good representation of the human motor control system. At least that's what we found when we, in some uh, experiments using human arm reaching to a moving target. It certainly is a great controller for assistive devices or rehabilitation devices. In terms of like biomedical engineering as a field, well, it's one of the fastest growing fields, especially in terms of employment for our students, right? So that's a huge opportunity. The fact that you know there's going to be all of these jobs in biomedical engineering over the next 10 years. And then I guess finally, you know, personally, what I find very exciting is that you now have all these fields starting to come together. So like biomechanics and robotics, we're starting to get these two topics at the same conferences now. 
and dynamics and control and machine learning. So all of these fields are no longer totally separate fields where people aren't talking to one another. And so with all of these fields coming together, you know, that's going to create a whole new generation of human-centered technologies. And so, you know, maybe we're all going to be, you know, faster, higher, and stronger, just like the Olympic athletes in the future. I'm hopeful. (laughs) I'm not getting any younger. (laughs) I think that's true for all of us, but... (laughs) I, I think the future is very exciting for this field. There's just so many opportunities from so many different perspectives. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you for all of your insights throughout the whole interview. It's been a pleasure talking with you and getting to learn more about you and your work and the work of your lab. And we're excited to continue to follow that and see all the amazing things that you continue to do. Well, I want to thank you guys for having me on your show. I think it's a great show. I think you're doing a really valuable service for the biomechanics community. I hope you're getting lots of recognition for it because I think it's a great thing. So, um, Yeah, keep it up. And thanks for having me on your show. Thanks so much, John. So thank you to John for such an amazing interview. We had a lot of fun and learned a lot. We have a quick research fail before we go. So this is actually more of a follow-up to a previous research fail. I talked about a number of uh, failures in terms of paper submissions that I've had uh, recently. But the other week, I was at a virtual conference and presenting some of the work from one of those papers, and I got a message on uh, over Zoom saying uh, from someone saying that they were interested in the work, they're an editor at this journal, and it would be great if I submitted the paper there. But unfortunately, it was one of the journals that I submitted to and was rejected from <laughs> because it wasn't deemed priority research. So I told the uh, I told him that, and he was like, "Oh, I'm sorry that you know it didn't end up on my desk." And I was like, "Well, I'm also so- I'm, I think I should be the one that's sorry yeah. it didn't end up on your desk." <laughs> but it just like kind of made me laugh and was I don't know just encouraging, and I think it kind of reminded me of what John said, and that you know sometimes these types of things are just out of our control, but we can continue on and you never know how things will play out. And I really think there's just a lot of power in having the optimism that they will work out um, and just continuing to do the best that you can. And knowing that maybe if it didn't get on that person's desk this time, that it'll get on someone else's desk who's ready to have it next time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Hannah. And thank you for listening. And thank you to the International Society of Biomechanics for their support and boom. And thank you to Peter Washington for all our amazing music that you hear. And if you'd like to submit a research fail, suggest a person to interview or get involved, email us at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter at biomechanicsoom and on Facebook and Instagram at biomechanicsonourminds. I'm Melissa. I'm Hannah. Biomechanics Biomechanics off our minds. minds.